Well, there is no one, and I mean no one, whose name has been more tempting to New York City's tabloid newspaper headline writers than the man who testified to the Manhattan grand jury today in the investigation of Donald Trump. He was the boss of the National Enquirer who entered an agreement, conspiracy of sorts, with Donald Trump and Donald Trump's then lawyer, Michael Cohen, to bury stories about Donald Trump, especially stories about Donald Trump and women. It was what they called a catch and kill scheme at the National Enquirer. The National Enquirer would catch the story by paying a woman for the exclusive rights to her story about Donald Trump. And then the National Enquirer would never run that story, kill the story, catch the story and kill the story. And the woman would not be able to tell her story to any other news organization because the National Enquirer would own the rights to her story. And then Donald Trump would reimburse the National Enquirer for whatever that cost the National Enquirer. That was the plan. That was the scheme. That was the conspiracy. It didn't work out quite that way when Stormy Daniels' lawyer offered the National Enquirer the rights to her story about one night she spent in a very brief sexual encounter with Donald Trump, according to her story. The boss of the National Enquirer decided to just put Michael Cohen in direct contact with Stormy Daniels' lawyer at the time so that Donald Trump, through Michael Cohen, could just buy Stormy Daniels' silence directly. That didn't mean that the boss of the National Enquirer escaped prosecutors' attention. When they were prosecuting Michael Cohen for violating campaign finance law in an attempt to affect the outcome of the election by making a $130,000 hush money payment to Stormy Daniels three weeks before the 2016 presidential election. Because silencing Stormy Daniels was beneficial to the Trump campaign, to put it mildly, the $130,000 violated campaign finance laws by exceeding the limit of campaign contributions and by not being recorded as a campaign contribution. The boss of the National Enquirer, who was supposed to be the mastermind of the catch and kill scheme for Donald Trump, was a man named David Pecker. Here is how the New York Daily News greeted the revelation in court in the Michael Cohen case that David Pecker was a witness in the grand jury investigation. There it is. That was the front page of the Daily News. When they found out, David Pecker was forced to go under oath in the Stormy Daniels investigation by federal prosecutors. Tomorrow's Daily News may have a headline of a similar spirit to convey the news that David Pecker testified today to the Manhattan grand jury that is investigating Donald Trump's involvement in the Stormy Daniels payoff. Because reporters are staking out the Manhattan courthouse, they can usually see who is coming and going at the grand jury room, but they have no idea what the testimony in the grand jury room actually is. David Pecker was reported as having testified to the grand jury in January. In a moment, we'll be joined by a former Manhattan district attorney, assistant district attorney, who will share his invaluable insights as to what could bring a witness like that back to the grand jury. After Michael Cohen pleaded guilty to federal crimes in the payoff he arranged to Stephanie Clifford, the actress known as Stormy Daniels, he testified to a House committee that the National Enquirer had what he called a treasure trove a treasure trove of documents about stories that the National Enquirer killed for Donald Trump. You also mentioned that the president was very concerned about the whereabouts of these documents and who possessed them. Does that treasure trove of documents still exist? I, I don't know. I had asked David Pecker for them. So you would say the person who knows the whereabouts of these documents would be David Pecker? David Pecker, Barry Levine, or... Um, Dylan Howard. The other two men worked for David Pecker at the National Enquirer. Donald Trump 
spent the weekend lying about the Manhattan District Attorney's grand jury investigation at a campaign rally in Texas that attracted a much smaller crowd than Trump campaign rallies used to attract. Donald Trump said the Manhattan District Attorney was working, quote, under the auspices and direction of the Justice Department in Washington, D.C. He, of course, called it the Injustice Department. And that is a lie. The Manhattan District Attorney operates with, a, with complete independence, as does the Justice Department. And they are both completely independent of the other in their current investigations of Donald Trump for a range of crimes that he may have committed. Donald Trump hearkened back this weekend to his life before politics, telling the following lie to the Texas crowd. I was leading this life. I didn't know what subpoena meant. Donald Trump has been hit with subpoenas in civil lawsuits virtually every year of his professional life. He has also been, he's also issued subpoenas in federal lawsuits, as all litigants are allowed to do, virtually every year of his professional life. Donald Trump has had subpoenas flying back and forth in his life every year of his life. Donald Trump's name had been, had been on more subpoenas than any other president in history before he entered politics. And he has set a record for presidents and former presidents being subpoenaed since he entered politics. Stephanie Clifford has offered very detailed evidence, including dialogue, describing her evening in a hotel room with Donald Trump. She has described what he was wearing and then what he wasn't wearing. Stephanie Clifford has quoted what Donald Trump said about how she reminded him of his daughter. At his rally on Saturday, Donald Trump offered a few words, and I mean very few words, of some sort of denial, apparently referring to what happened in that hotel room. Here is a picture of Donald Trump and Stephanie Clifford, also known as Stormy Daniels. He said in Texas this weekend that I never liked her. Except he didn't say her. He used a nasty term that he thinks is a clever insult about her looks, which, as that photograph proves, Stephanie, Dan uh, Stephanie Clifford is a far more attractive person than Donald Trump. And then Donald Trump said this. And, and if you have trouble following this, remember, this is Donald Trump talking when he is trying to lie about his evening with Stormy Daniels. So he struggles with each sentence or attempt at a sentence. This is what he said. He said, I never liked, I never, it's just not a terrible thing. That wouldn't be the one. There is no one. We have a great first lady who people really do love. And she has done an incredible job. Not anything. They have nothing. That's Donald Trump apparently trying to say, as he has said before, that if he wanted to have an affair, it would not be with Stephanie Clifford. That wouldn't be the one, he said. And then he realized that some of the people in his Texas audience might still be conservative enough to think no one would be the one to have an affair with. And so Donald Trump caught himself and on the next sentence said, there is no one. And that's when he, when the logic of what he was supposed to say, that's apparently what, what was in there. That's what he was trying to say. And the logic of that would mean that the next sentence would be, I love my wife. Something like, I love my third wife and I have always been strictly faithful to my third wife in every sense of that word. But Donald Trump could not bring himself to say any version of, I love my wife. Something politicians usually find pretty easy to say, no matter how true it is or isn't. Instead of saying, I love my wife, Donald Trump said, we have a great first lady who people really do love. And he didn't even bother to count himself among those people. And then he gave his wife what Donald Trump thinks is the greatest possible compliment he could ever give a Trump wife. She has done an incredible job. Imagine, imagine you're Donald Trump's criminal defense lawyers tonight. 
looking at the documentary evidence of the $130,000 sent by Michael Cohen to Stormy Daniels, lawyer to pay off Stormy Daniels, and you're looking at the checks Donald Trump wrote to Michael Cohen to cover up that payoff. And you imagine putting your client, Donald Trump, on the witness stand in Manhattan in his own defense, and then you hear him say to an audience of a few thousand Trump fanatics in Texas, that wouldn't be the one. Meaning, I, Donald Trump, an expert on Donald Trump having affairs, insist to you that's not a person Donald Trump would have an affair with. And then, as Donald Trump's criminal defense lawyer, you listen, hoping that your client, Donald Trump, can find a way of saying, I love my wife. And he's never been under more public pressure in his life to say, I love my wife, and he cannot bring himself to say it. Those words do not cross his mind. If you're Donald Trump's lawyers, and he is indicted in the Stormy Daniels case in Manhattan, you know that your only chance of getting a not guilty is to put Donald Trump on the witness stand to try to convince that jury that the only reason he participated in the Stormy Daniels payoff scheme was not to hide Stormy Daniels' story from American voters a couple of weeks before they voted for president in 2016. It was only, only to spare the feelings of his third wife, the wife who he says people really do love. If you're Donald Trump's criminal defense lawyers, you know that Donald Trump will not have an easy time convincing a Manhattan jury about anything, including how much he loves his third wife, the one he says people really do love.